So good morning. Uh, my name is Manda Mayangua, and I am the director of the Africa program here at the Wilson Center. And on behalf of the Wilson Center's Africa program and the Wilson Center's environmental change and security programs, as well as our partner, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, I'd like to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars. We're very pleased to co-host this event, which seeks to look at how environmental and human security crises in Africa can be preempted and their negative impacts minimized through science-based analysis of climate variability. I'd also like at this point to issue a special welcome uh, to all of those who are joining us via our webcast. I do see some familiar faces uh, in the audience and to all of you, and especially to my uh, sister from Uganda, the ambassador from Uganda, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us here today. Uh, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with the uh, Wilson Center, it was established in 1968 by an act of Congress, and unlike many of the physical presidential monuments in the, national, the nation's capital, it is a living memorial whose work and scholarship commemorates the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson, our 21st uh, president and our first internationalist president. Today, the Woodrow Wilson Center provides a safe, nonpartisan space where the worlds of policymaking and scholarship intersect. By conducting relevant and timely research and promoting dialogue from all perspectives, the Wilson Center works to address critical current and emerging challenges confronting the United States and the world. The topic of this event today certainly fits that mold, and we're pleased to partner with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies to advance the dialogue and offer some strategies as well as practical options to more effectively address climate variability threats in Africa. The Africa Center has really done a lot of work in this area and have taken uh, the charge on this issue and on this event. And so with that, and to allow us to quickly get into the substance of why we're here today, let me turn the microphone over to Ms. Kate Omquistnov, the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, to offer a few welcoming remarks. Kate? Good morning. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be here this morning on behalf of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, uh, and we're so pleased to be partnering with the Wilson Center to conduct this event. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, several other partners that we have uh, on this series of uh, programs and uh, this broader dialogue that uh, you'll hear a piece of this morning. You know, the Environmental Security Division at AFRICOM, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Institute for the Global the, for Institute for the Analysis of, of Global Security. Uh, and the South Africa-based Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. The Africa Center is uh, a Department of Defense institution, for those of you who don't know us, uh, focused on strategic security studies, research, and outreach in Africa. We engage African partner states and institutions through rigorous academic and outreach programs that build strategic capacity and foster long-term collaborative relationships. And we support United States foreign and security policy objectives by strengthening the strategic capacity of African states to identify and resolve security challenges in ways that promote civil military cooperation, respect for democratic values, and safeguard human rights. As many of you know, since you're uh, here this morning for this uh, topic, the 2014 report issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change analyzed trends in climate variability and identified uh, particular rainfall and temperature stresses across the continent. It is clear that these uh, uh, impact lives and livelihoods for millions of Africans. But what is still unclear uh, is precisely how and to what extent the effects of climate variability impact security outcomes in Africa. ACSS and collaborating partners took the first step to explore this question in May 2014 by convening an experts workshop that involved leading African scholars from universities and research institutions, representatives from international organizations, and officials from the African Union and regional communities. This event considered lessons from a number of case studies and outlined a number of recommendations for both policy and practice. And I'm not going to summarize them for you. You're going to get a taste of, of them and some more discussion of those uh, recommendations here with the, our two panels this morning. This event uh, today takes the dialogue uh, further uh, by continuing to analyze the water security nexus in Africa, uh, by examining practical options for African countries, and by identifying the roles and responsibilities for African states and external actors. 
And it's our hope that today's deliberations and exchanges will help pave the way for more meaningful collaboration in this important area. I'm particularly uh, encouraged uh, by this topic and uh, this um, configuration, shall I say, of communities coming together to discuss an important uh, dimension of the security development nexus. Um, some of you may know that I previously served on the development end of the spectrum at uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. I know many colleagues are, are in the audience and uh, participating uh, on that side. And, and now from the security sector angle, uh, it's uh, particularly encouraging to see how uh, we can come across the communities to have this uh, exchange and dialogue together to understand what the science tells us, what the data suggests, uh, what more work we need to do on that front, but how we translate all of that into to policy and practice from both the development end and the security end and meeting in the middle at the political uh, end of the spectrum. So you know, I uh, encourage you all to have a, a robust uh, and uh, a lively exchange this morning and very much looking forward to hearing the further recommendations. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Rosner. I'm a senior fellow with the Institute for the Analysis of Global Security, which is a uh, not-for-profit based think tank here in Washington, D.C. Um, IAGS has worked for a decade and a half on the links between U.S. national security and energy and the energy exchange. Uh, five years ago, we began examining um, through a consortium that we, along with Morris Clausen, who you'll be introduced to later from CSIR in South Africa, and some of our Swedish colleagues at the um, Stockholm International Water Institute and also at the Stockholm Environmental Institute. So we had a consortium and we began examining the water, energy, and security nexus um, and trying to push that from the, from the ground, and it's been quite a push so far. Um, I'm pleased to be moderating the session this morning on uh, this nexus, the water, energy, and security nexus. And I'm just gonna briefly mention the, um, the panelists, and if they like to mention anything more beyond their title about their institution, they may do so. Um, to my less left is uh, Professor Colleen Vogel. I met Colleen in Stellenbosch um, back in May. Um, she's at the University of Pretoria. Uh, next to Colleen is um, Abdoulaye Sanusi. Executive Secretary of the Lake Chad Commission, who I haven't yet um, to have the opportunity to meet and discuss anything with. And then to my far left is um, Professor Longay, Chair of the Technical, Technical Committee with the Global Water Partnership. Um, just so we set some ground rules here, I asked my colleagues to, to speak between 10, but absolutely maximum 15 minutes. Um, what we'll do after we conclude the presentations or after the conclusion of each presentation, um, if there's a question on clarity, that is you didn't understand something that one of the panelists sought to define a concept, something like that, you can ask a question at that point, but please not on substance. What we'd like to do is to move through the presentations and then, and then go through the questions and allow the panelists to respond to those um, on an individual basis. So with no further ado, Colleen. Do you want me to stand up there? Or? It's up to you. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you all very much for inviting me to be part of this very interesting debate and dialogue. Um, it's very difficult in 15 minutes to give a detailed account and synopsis and expose, if you like, of such a vast and very nuanced topic, but I hope I can do my best. I'm going to depart from the paper that I wrote, which I must add was one of the most difficult papers to write. <laughs> Perhaps it's because it was in Washington, I don't know. <laughs> but um, I was very aware of the audience and who I was writing for. But having been part of the IPCC, both of the fourth assessment and the fifth assessment, um, I'm, I'm kind of used to those issues, and I just want to say I'm not wearing my IPCC hat, but will obviously reflect on some of those things. So what I'd like to do this morning is to frame my discussions using the word framing, um, coming at it from three ways of framing issues, because I think these issues that we're dealing with are, as some of you know, wicked problems, and in fact, uh, I think we need to almost get the neuroscientists into the room, because our brains, I think, can't handle the multiplicity of the complexity of some of these issues. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is how do you frame the issue, because we all have our own 
agendas, all our own paradigms, the way we come at the problem. And one of the neat uh, ways of framing it, I'd like to cite a paper um, by Gray and Sadoff, some of you might know of their work, where they frame the water security issue as the following. And they say it's framed broadly as the availability of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods, ecosystems, and production. But then they don't stop there. They actually couple it with an interesting add-on, which is an acceptable level of water-related risks to people, environments, and economies. So I want to start my first point by saying this entry point, the way we come into the room with all our different backgrounds and where we're coming from, our different training, I think that definition, if you like, or framing of water security is quite interesting. What they do then, they, they then use that as their entry point into looking at different continents and different cases, and they track for Asia, but more particularly interestingly for Africa, and if you've read their paper, they use a very neat way of making you remember the issues they want to raise by using the three H's. And they say, essentially, in many countries, particularly in, in African countries, you can either define water security as those places being hampered by hydrology, where those places have harnessed hydrology, and where those places are being held hostage to hydrology. And I would argue in the African t context, we are particularly hostage to hydrology. Why is that? Because of the nature of the rainfall that we receive. So I'd like to leave you with a take home message that there is an issue of we are hampered by our hydrology because of the backlog of storage issues, etc. But more importantly, I think we are hostage to the particular hydrologies which keep us in many cases poor. And they also make our, if you like, stored growth is an issue because of these um, concerns. So just following on the thesis a little bit more, I'd just like to leave you with two things before I move on to the second framing. And that is the way they pose the duality of water into both a productive and a destructive element. So it's not just about the absence of water, but it's also about the presence of water. And I think if you look on the television this morning, it's not just an issue for us in Africa that we have to deal with, but I see Arizona and California kind of mimic those two ways of looking at things. So that's the first point. How we frame the debate, I think, is really critical. Because if we don't have a common kind of understanding, I think we could do maladaptation and not necessarily adaptation. And then the second point I'd like to say, it's also important how you frame the climate change discourse. Um, many of us want an agreement, you know, Paris is going to be critical, but I've been party to so many discussions where my well-meaning climatology friends and meteorologists come into the room and they run through their simulation, the GCM model, and they switch it on and by 2070 the whole of Africa is red. Um, and it just gets redder and redder and redder. And you can look around the room and everyone's kind of feeling very uneasy. <laughs> um, and it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it's marginalizing because you lose your sense of agency because you kind of think, well, I just can't do anything about that. And so where I try and work is more on the variability component. And I think, and I have to be careful here how I frame this because I do work with various colleagues, et cetera, at different levels. But it really is the variability issue that I think is critical for us in terms of water security. So the rates of change are going to become fundamentally important because it's those rates of change that shift us into business in different ways. So your institutional design can't really cope if your rate of change is being exceeded too quickly. So while I'm not saying the overall change is not important, I think we need to be focusing more here on the now and really looking at the tails of the distribution. It's in those tails where things are happening. For example, in my home in Johannesburg, in the beginning of the year, for the first time, my house was flooded. And I live in a very nice house. And um, for the first time, my young children went, oh, mom, maybe you know, global warming is important and we need to do something about this. So keep flying, keep doing whatever you're doing. But it's those sudden changes when we stretch those, uh, if you like, narrowly defined ways we've been looking at things. So that's my second point. We need to be framing the climate change discourse in this bigger thing called water security also carefully. But it's really my third point that I want to leave you with, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time and make that a little bit more forceful, because I think it's how you frame the solution space that is fundamentally important. And uh, maybe at, at the risk of never being invited to another meeting again as a scientist, I, I think the science needs a reframing um, if we want to tackle these problems. So let me clarify what I mean. You can frame this problem of water security depending, if you like, on two kind of paradigmatic perspectives. The one is technological change. So there's a technological solution. We need to store water. We need to move that water. We need to make it accessible and so on. And obviously, that's key. In Africa, we're lagging way behind 
But if you only look at dam storage and hydropower from that perspective and you miss out all the power dynamics that go into moving people to design the dams and so on and so forth, you're missing a whole huge wadge of stuff that you need to be including. So technological solutions are good and they, they fine, but that then, if you're only looking at it from that perspective, tends to frame it from one space and you exclude people who could come into that space to help you. So I've been very privileged in the past to be a, a chair of the International Human Dimensions Program which was one of the global change programs and it really was fascinating to work with economists, social scientists from all sides um, in terms of bringing them into that space and seeing what we can do. But we also need to be looking at the institutional space and we discussed that a lot yesterday about governance, about water pricing, about laws and so on. So these two dimensions, how you frame that solution space is critical. So as I conclude, I'd like to leave you with the post-normal science debate, which I'm sure some of you know about, <laughs> mode one and mode two, uh, Gibbons, Novotny and others. I really think that it's not just about interdisciplinarity that's going to help us crack this issue. Um, I do believe, I myself having worked for over 35 years in this space of climate variability and climate change, we need to open up the discourse. We, you know, People more than scientists have knowledge. They have knowledge that's very useful and maybe that knowledge hasn't been you know, PhD awarded but it has some traction and they've been experimenting out there. So I'm very privileged to work with very, very informed communities, not only from a traditional knowledge perspective, but just from local knowledge perspectives. And then I work with government at the local planning level and above. And I think unless we open up that transdisciplinary space really wide and fully, I don't think we're going to really do much. I think we'll just be doing business as usual, spending a lot of USAID money, uh, billions and millions, and obviously you might do something that's useful. But I think if you want the sustainability, we really need to push that, that space. So I'd like to conclude by just saying, I think framing is fundamental. It's maybe a kind of, you can't be serious. That's kind of obvious. But I think sometimes as scientists, we're so busy pushed by the funding agencies within our five-year grants to get to the deliverables, to get to the indicators, that we don't have time to actually do the stuff that really will make a difference. So my call is for us to think not only as scientists, but even as funders around a reframing. And I'm going to repeat that. A reframing of what we're trying to do. Why is it we even interested in this issue. Because often as I've worked in communities, I sometimes think, you know, maybe I shouldn't have gone there at all. Maybe I should have just stayed away. Because uh, sometimes I think we do maladaptation in a really well-meaning sense, but we kind of can sometimes mess it up, I think. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with the three points. Framing the discourse. How do you enter into the discussion? There's lots of framings around water security, but it is critical to have some kind of common understanding. It doesn't have to be, you know, each word uh, fully commonly understood by it, but at least, at least in the room, have a kind of a, you know, vision of where we're trying to go. Number two, um, to really look at the framing of climate change and to pull back a little bit and look at climate variability, because I think in Africa, the countries that I've worked in, it's really the variability issue that's going to be piggybacked onto the longer term climate change issue that's going to be fundamental. And that has a whole set of issues around institutions and how the flexibility and the resilience that you then design to manage that. And then finally, I'm going to do the punt for transdisciplinary research. Uh, you've got fantastic people in this country doing that, people uh, like Sheila Jasanoff at the Kennedy School of Government and others who are really trying to call for a different way of framing uh, the science and that really goes to knowledge and power issues. So thank you very much for indulging me and um, it's just a few thoughts from the bathtub, so to speak. Thank you. So thank you very much, Colleen. So are there any questions on this of clarity, is there something that you didn't understand in her discourse that you'd like her to redefine, or if not, we can move on? Yes. What was the report that you're quoting from at the very beginning on water security? Oh, the water security paper. Yes, it was from Gray and Sadoff, and I can give you the, the full details of the paper, but there's even a better paper. Well, no, I, would, I need to be careful, uh, an add-on paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whoops. Uh, by uh, Cook and Backer, and I'll, I'll give you both of those in the, in the break. But the Gray and Sadoff uh, articulation of water security seems to have been picked up by a lot of people. Okay. Sir? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, do you want me to answer that now or later? Could you just answer it in short sure. drift? Sure. Short now and um, I, I think the issue around sea level change is quite difficult to measure precisely. And for me, what I see and from the scientists that I work with, and maybe Marius can comment about that also later, it's not only just about the rising sea, it's about surges, the storm surges. So that's really what's kind of battering. And again, it comes down to not waiting to do something in the longer term, but actually trying to manage it in the shorter term. But I can discuss that if you want more accurate scientific estimations of that later on. Okay. You can move on, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is, uh, as mentioned, Sanusi Imran Abdullahi, Executive Secretary, Lecture at Basin Commission. I uh, understand most of you, or a few of you, don't know about Lecture, but uh, I'll try to make you understand about uh, Lecture and what it's all about. Uh, I also understand that. Uh, a paper has been written on human security dimension in the lake chat. Uh, you can find that information from the African Center. I've been asked uh, by the African Center to uh, address three issues relating to the, uh, the activities of the Commission as far as water, energy, and security is concerned in Africa. Um, let me just say that the, the lake chat Basin Commission was established 50 years ago, uh, on 22nd May 1964, by a convention called the Fort Lamy Convention, uh, by the four countries that border the Lake Chad directly. And the countries are Cameroon, Niger, Nigeria, and Chad itself. Uh, subsequently, uh, other countries within the region uh, uh, joined, the uh, Central African Republic, and Libya. Many people ask normally, why Libya? but we can address that if somebody wants to know about that during the break. We also have countries that are observer members to the commission. We have uh, Sudan, uh, Congo, DR, Congo, Brazzaville, and uh, Egypt. We are also considering uh, the application of Algeria uh, to be a member of the commission. The, the jurisdiction of the commission extends to uh, as far as Algeria, uh, but uh, basically we are working in the area of 960,000 square kilometer within the immediate uh, uh, part of the Sahel. And um, the Lake Chad Basin Commission active area that we are concerned, especially with, in terms of security, water or, or otherwise, uh, involves three regions of Cameroon, three regions of Central Africa, two regions of Niger, six states of Nigeria, and the entire Chad Republic. The mandate of the commission includes sustainable and equitable management of the water resources in the Lake Chad, which are basically uh, a transboundary and the wetlands within the, the catchment area of the basin. We also are mandated to preserve and protect the ecosystem in the catchment and we are also uh, expected to promote integration, <coughs> regional uh, and economic activities, and preserve peace and security in the region. Uh, the commission staff are locally recruited from the area of the member states, and uh, a lot of information can be found on our website, www.cblt.org, and then you can have a lot of information. Uh, we have been asked to to mention efforts by the Commission to address Africa's water and security challenges that has taken place of recent. Based on the, the outcome of several studies that uh, were conducted with the help of, uh, the, Afri uh, with the, help of the World Bank, UNDP, Jeff, uh, AMCAO, AMSEN, African Development Bank, and the German government, uh, several uh, policy documents have been developed, which include the strategic uh, action plan of the Commission which were also based in line with the Vision 2025 of the Commission. And such actions have been developed as uh, the conduction and approval of a feasibility study for transfer of water from the Congo Basin to the Lake Chad to address the drying of the Lake Chad. Lake Chad in the 60s was 25,000 square kilometer. Of recent arguments are it's, it's about two and a half 
thousand square kilometer or three thousand square kilometer, depending on the the rains that we receive in a particular year. So ninety percent, eighty to ninety percent of the volume or surface area of the lake has been lost over over time. And uh, one of the primary uh, solutions to the replenishing of the lake chart is the transfer of water from the Congo uh, to the lake chart. This study was conducted by CIMA International of Canada, and the outcome of the studies uh, have shown that the water transfer project is feasible and technically viable and expected to improve the volume of water in the lake chart by 1.5 uh, meters. And uh, in terms of area, we expect to recover 7,500 square kilometer of the area of the lake chart within a period of five to six years. This uh, program, in addition, is expected to provide uh, employment opportunities in the Congo area and is also expected to improve and regulate navigation on the Congo, uh, on the Obangi that leads into the, the Congo. And uh, we expect to produce hydropower, which is a much needed uh, energy source in the Congo area. Also, the program is expected to restore socioeconomic activities in the sub-region, eradicate poverty, and guarantee sustainable peace and security. We also have succeeded in drafting and, and have obtained the approval of the, uh, uh, the political heads of a legal instrument which we call Lake Chad Basin Commission Water Charter, which is a legal instrument to allow the Commission to enforce integrated water resources management practice in the member states and to regulate activities uh, that are related to water and environment. We also have succeeded in articulating a five-year investment plan which is uh, tailored towards improving uh, the, the situation in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, also has a component of the national action plans of member states that are uh, complementary to the programs that are transboundary, uh, so that uh, the, the the people in the in the in the basin area will now have a more secure, sustainable economic activities that will now uh, uh, improve their livelihood and probably, uh, most likely, uh, stabilize the, the the system in the area and maintain security, uh, peace and security. The, the uh, five-year investment plan is a translation of concrete actions that are expected to be implemented uh, that will uh, guarantee uh, economic activities in the, in the basin uh, for, for, the, for the population. We've also uh, succeeded in uh, reactivating what we call a regional parliamentary committee uh, involving member states, uh, national assemblies, to allow uh, the commission have uh, the necessary access to the national assemblies of member states for the uh, for for them to lobby for our programs, and also we will use the parliamentarians to also speak to other parliamentarians across the world uh, for easy understanding of the, the, the message that we want uh, the international community also to know, especially parliaments, for the support of our programs and support of the, uh, the member states. Uh, this uh, committee also is uh, gender sensitive. It is insisted that at least one parliamentarian should be a female. And uh, the, the, also the parliamentary committee will assist the commission in ensuring that uh, national budgets of member countries include the statutory contribution of member states to the commission for its function. Security is critical. Without security, no activity can take place wherever in the world. So we also have succeeded uh, in convincing the political heads to reactivate and expand uh, what we found there as uh, a military outfit, which is uh, mandated to secure the security in the area. And we have the, this uh, uh, multinational joint task force reactivated to include all member countries, 
each member countries is to provide a, a battalion to the force and the the multinational joint task force is to be uh, managed by the commission under the supervision of the existing uh, chairman of the summit of head of states and government who naturally is the commander in chief in his country we we've also uh, uh, succeeded in with the support of uh, the U.S. government and the French government succeeded in getting our heads of state to meet regularly on security in the area. Uh, there was a meeting in Paris. Uh, there will soon be a meeting in, in, in Yame, and there were subsequent meetings by security experts in London and uh, in Yawindi and in Abuja also. Because peace is the key thing. Once we have peace and security, we'll be able to implement programs that will help address issues of water security and energy in the region. I've also been asked to to mention uh, any other programs or which of the programs will address immediate concerns, uh, immediate and uh, medium-term concerns in, uh, as far as water uh, challenges and security are concerned. Well, to us, the five-year investment plan has been tailored to address immediate, medium, and even long-term challenges as far as water, environment, and security is concerned. The overall objective of the program actually is improvement of living standard of the population in the Lake Chad Basin and to ensure sustainable security in the region. The, the National Action Plans component of the program are tailored towards uh, ensuring good governance, environmental awareness and provision of infrastructure that will allow economic activity to flourish to guarantee a source of livelihood in the area to to ensure that people are not used as raw material for security challenges because when people are idle and they have nothing to do they can easily be taken over by terrorists and other people who will use them the we have about 30 million people whose livelihood depend entirely on the natural resources in the Lake Chad. And the more we lose the natural uh, resources and biodiversity in the Lake Chad, the more these people become vulnerable to terrorists and to other criminal activities that are posing challenge to the security in the Sahel and part of West Africa. I'm also asked to mention which role will continue to play to ensure that the international community and the African countries are involved in actualizing this program that are addressing water, energy, and security challenges. Well, the Commission has been fully engaged in uh, uh, convincing traditional uh, donors to the Commission, which are generally United Nations agencies. But recently, we've held uh, a donors conference in Bologna, Italy, under the chairmanship of uh, President Prodi, who is the European champion for the uh, effort to save Lake Chad and the ecosystem in the area. We also have the uh, active uh, collaboration and support of a former president uh, of Nigeria, uh, President Obasanjo, who is also a champion for the safeguard of the Lake Chad and the ecosystem. We also have the support of uh, Deputy Arba Diallo, a former executive secretary of the United Nations Convention on the, uh, Combating Desertification, who is also a champion of the cause to save Lake Chad and the ecosystem. We are also uh, looking into sourcing or contacting new donors, especially in, in Asia, in the Gulf region, and uh, in, in Latin America to support the cause to save Lake Chad. We are also looking at uh, innovative uh, financing by involving uh, private sectors, both national and international, to see uh, the, uh, the benefits of financing investments in the, in the Lake Chad Basin uh, so that uh, they will uh, be partners to us and uh, uh, also benefit in their, in their efforts to, to be private uh, entrepreneurs. We have uh, made efforts also to engage uh, 
the government of the United States. Uh, we've not been successful so far, but uh, I think this uh, platform has given us opportunity to make contacts with the State, uh, State Department and, and uh, ensure that uh, our uh, cause is addressed or, ac or at least listened to so that we can have the attention of the U.S. government. We've made efforts through the embassy in Chad to see that uh, uh, efforts are made to address our request for support in terms of uh, capacity building the military uh, aspect to ensure peace and security in the region. <coughs> So despite a number of challenges that we are p uh, facing in the region, uh, efforts have been made uh, to address uh, the challenges that we have as far as water, uh, energy, and security is concerned. But much has to be done because uh, at the current uh, moment, the security challenge in the region is probably at its highest peak. And we need the support of all the uh, consultants <coughs> who have the, uh, uh, the knowledge and the, uh, the ability to support us to <coughs> ensure that we bring uh, back peace and security in the region to allow activities to take place. Thank you very, very much. Excellent. Um, so at the risk of <laughs> questions of clarification only, please. We're all set? Yes. yes. Uh, will the situation on Lake Chad improve in time once the, uh, the Congo declares independence? Is that something that will stay or is the Congo itself threatened uh, due to global warming uh, at, its at the highest levels in Africa, which would have glaciers that require send water into the Congo, uh, so it flows? Uh, but is this re being reduced slowly? And, and how far would the reduction be once uh, the diversion is made? Uh, does it threaten dams further down on the Congo? If there is any, I can't remember if there is or there isn't, but perhaps you know more than me. Uh, I'm sure you know uh, that uh, the Obangi River, which we are going to dam uh, to allow uh, the transfer of water to the Lake Chad, is a tributary of the Congo. And I'm sure you know that 430,000 uh, cubic meter per second goes into the ocean on the Congo itself. And you know the Inga Dam project also uh, is in the pipeline. But as far as our studies show, we are taking uh, close to nothing out of what is uh, going into the, the Congo as far as the, the water uh, in that region is concerned. Of course, yes, there will be some minimal uh, side effect. Environmental impact assessments have been carried, and we are still reviewing issues to see that minimal environmental impact uh, takes place, but whatever you do, there will be the positive side and the negative side. It only needs to balance which one is more positive. But we have the political support of the governments in the Congo to continue with this program. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, if we could move on now, Professor Longe. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Longe, the President, Global Water Partnership Technical Committee, West Africa. I've been asked to discuss three issues, the efforts of GWP in Africa in water and security, then project proposal to address immediate and long-term challenges in Africa water sector, then the role of GWP in the project proposal. Permit me to give you a preamble. The Global Water Partnership is a network of partners in the water sector. It is an NGO, and it was founded in 1996 to foster integrated water resources management, which is defined as the coordinated development and management of water land, and related resources. The reason being to maximize economic and social welfare without compromising the sustainability of the resource, and at the same time, in order to enhance vital environmental systems. And when, you look, when we look at Global Water Partnership in relation to water security, 
and energy. We have a mission. The mission is to advance governance and management of water resources for sustainable and equitable development for a water-secured world. And I'm going to say one or two things on the security, the way the global, partner, global water partnership looks at it. One, there's a big challenge. The challenge is that water is a factor of life, and water is also a final resource, which can be depleted either directly by usage or by contamination and pollution. And water is needed for development. In fact, it's a driver of, for de development. If we are to feed the world and contribute to pover poverty reduction, human health, economic prosperity, then attention must be given to water. The question that one can ask is, how does water challenge affect water security? In GWP, we advocate that a water secure world is necessary for sustainable development. And that is according to the global strategy between 2009 and 2013. We believe that a water secured world integrates a concern for the intrinsic value of water with a concern for its use of human survival and well being. Not only that, it is a world where communities are protected from floods, droughts, landslides, erosion, and waterborne diseases. Water security, therefore, is to address environmental protection and the negative effects of poor management. A water-secured world is to have fragmented responsibility for water and integrating water resources management across all sectors, finance, planning, agriculture, energy, tourism, industry, education, and health. Now, what is the relationship of GWP and the need for water security? We believe water is, a, is key to development, to food security, nutrition security, poverty reduction, economic growth, energy production, and human health. Water is the nexus. Water is a key factor in the, in the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. <coughs> then, what is then water security? We have been talking of security and security, but we believe that water security, without it, there will be no food security. There is not going to be energy security. Then, there is going to be a compromise in the poverty. Instead of reducing it, the poverty reduction will abate. And economic growth will not be sustainable. Water being the central development of all that man does, all the, and all the developments, investing therefore in water will deliver immediate benefits as well as long-term social, economic, and environmental resilience. Now let me address the three things that have been asked to do. One, recent efforts of GWP to address Africa water and security. Our approach is IIRWM based, that is Integrated Water Resources Management. And there are three basic pillars that explains the aims of global water partnership. The first one is creating an enabling environment for suitable policies, strategies, and legislation <coughs> for sustainable water resources development and management. The second one is institutional framework under which to put down practice the policies, strategies, and legislation that back up the development and management of water. And the third one is setting up of management instruments that will be required to drive the policies and also to provide training and capacity for the institution. What are the general efforts? The GWP believes that holistic approach to water resources management 
is the key to sustainable development of the stress resource for water security in Africa. I represent Global Water Partnership West Africa. We've been able to promote integrated water resources management in partnership with AMCO and ECOWAS. In the West Africa sub-region, it has helped countries and stakeholders in the operation of integrated water resources management principles through active partnership. Also, through this partnership, ECOWAS has adopted a regional water policy which aims, which aims to contributing to poverty reduction, water security, and sustainable development of the resource. The Global Water Partnership West Africa also is working with basin organization in general, and in particular with Niger Basin Authority. My friend has just given examples of Lake Chad. We also collaborate with them. The Organization for the Development of the Senegal River, the Organization for the Development of Gamba River, Gambia River, and the Volta Basin Authority, with the sole aim to strengthen transboundary cooperation for water resources management. Let me try to explain the specific efforts that Global Water Partnership made in the past few years. But whatever effort that has been made is based on the GWP strategy for 2009-2014. And we have four strategic goals. Those strategic goals, under the, uh, the strategic goals, I'm going to give the accomplishment of Global Water Partnership. The first goal is to ensure water is a key part of sustainable development at national level. At the regional level, that is Africa, Global Water Partnership initiated the Water, Climate, and Development Program, WAGDEP, to meet with the demand of African Ministers' Council on Water for the implementation of the declaration of the Summit of the Head of States in 2008. WADEP is a five-year program from May 2011 to April 2016. The aim is to integrate water security and climate resilience in the development planning processes build climate resilience and support countries to adapt to a new climate regime through increased investments in water security. The initiative will contribute to peace building and conflict, conflict prevention, support pan-African integration, and safeguard investments, poverty reduction. Already we have a pilot scheme that is going on and is going to cover eight countries but for now, we have Burkina Faso and Ghana on the pilot scheme with the following four river basins, Volta, Lake Chad, Lake Victoria, Kegera, and Limpopo Basin. At the sub-regional level, that is, in West Africa sub-regional level, the GWP also initiated a study on the development of the Volta Basins Authority Master Plan for Sustainable Development and Water Resources Management in tandem with climate resilience. What we have been able to do is to provide a guideline and principle for sustainable development of basins in that particular basin. Also in Burkina Faso, we have helped to develop of a process of the National Adaptation to Water, Climate and Adaptation Program with a workshop that was, planned, that was sponsored by WAGDEP, and the finalization was done early this year. On the country level also, we have National Adaptation Plan for Climate Change in Ghana, which is study to establish collaboration with the most relevant national bodies to ensure the integration of water security in national program. Strategy Strategic goal two, address critical development challenges. I'm just going to give a few here because I have a number of them. In Ghana, we also participated in the implementation of WACDEP. A baseline study was carried out. Not necessarily Global Water Partnership is not the one that we do the baseline study. All we do is to coordinate and to make sure that they have the right 
consultants to carry out the project. In the district of Bulang, Bulangata, in the northern part of the country, in Burkina Faso, a study of the mapping of the vulnerability of, of water resources has been carried out in conjunction with Permanent Secretariat of the National Council on Environment and Sustainable Development. Let me, has, let me add another one here. The GWP, West Africa, also support the establishment process of a body to manage the Mono River Basin, shared by Benin and Togo under the ECOWAS. Let me go to strategic goal number three, reinforce knowledge sharing and communication. In this situation, what we aim at is to create visibility for the country water partnership and at the same time credibility. Most of the country water partnership, that is the ones in the countries, they are very weak because of finance. So what we do is to help them to create visibility, make them to register with the government, register as NGO, so that they can be recognized. Most of the world country water partnership are yet to register. And by strengthening through various actions and initiatives, for instance, we are able to train experts from ECOWAS member states, NGOs, and media in West Africa to, through toolbox. Toolbox is an essential tool for capacity building. Then the CWP Nice Senegal, with the support of GWP, organized training of lect of to lect for lecturers on toolbox. Strategic goal number four is oh, building. Professor Longi, yes. if you have just about two more minutes, yes. and then I'm going perhaps, to finish. It. Okay, very good. Building a more effective network, that is visibility and registration of stakeholders. Proposal to address immediate and long-term challenges is based on our strategy for 2014 and 2016, and the technical committee will be involved to provide global intellectual leadership and also to provide demand-driven technical support to the regional country partnership. We are proposing a project diagnostic study on transboundary coastal aquifers management, which we know in West Africa, in, this, in the coastal area, the water is polluted, there is contamination, the knowledge about the groundwater situation, we don't know. And uh, it's going to take this form. Tax number one, knowledge of aquifer system, dialogue communication, institutional aspect, environmental and socio-economic irrigation, and skills acquisition. Let me go to the role that the Global Water Partnership is going to play. The main asset of Global Water Partnership is that of advocate dialogue between stakeholders and the countries. The participation of GWP includes seeking for funding projects, give advice according to the need of individual country partnership through its technical committee members. We encourage research and exchange of information at the sub-regional and national levels among researchers. The concluding remark, the Global Partnership believes that a holistic approach to water resources management is the key to sustainable development of the stray resources for water security in Africa. The management of the resource should take into account all users with the aim of an equitable efficient management and a sustainable use of water resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to um, move into the, the Q&A um, period now. I would ask that the questions be a question, not multiple questions, uh, and it's really a question, not a comment. I'd, I'd prefer to hold, if you have a comment, to hold those to the end so that we can benefit from the input of the experts gathered here. So first question, and I'm only going to take one at a time. All right, well, you've asked, I'll let, let this lady here first. Um. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bremer at SAIS. I was very interested in your presentation on Lake Chad, the, Lake, the proposed Lake Chad to Obengi River diversion project, but a little Googling tells me that's a 14 plus billion dollar project. 
And I'm wondering if you're looking at other options because um, given the population served, I don't see private investment in that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, the, uh, the study, the estimate is uh, $14.5 billion. And um, we are looking for that money, and we're going to get it. <laughs> 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 so uh, the, the, the option we are adopting now, while we're looking for the money, is the issue that is addressed under the five-year investment plan. We are, are going to address the issue of the uh, river training aspects and enforcing this integrated water resources management practice to see what effect will this have on the uh, uh, water coming to the lake. After a couple of years, uh, we see what we have and we see what we can do. But this uh, program has been analyzed to see that it's uh, economically viable and we are likely to, and we're sure we are going to get uh, private sector involved. The energy to be sold will uh, recover the, the cost and uh, we have the commitment of the political heads in the region to contribute substantial amount of money. Anybody else like to comment on that? Okay, another question. Let me see if I can go to the back here, or the for one at the furthest in the back. Okay, well, sir, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Lawrence Freeman from the Africa Desk EIR. And, uh, I think water is one of the key to infrastructure development for the continent. I think it's part of the tree out of energy and rail development. Lake Chad has been dear to my heart for, for many years. I've been in and out of uh, Nigeria for quite a while. Have you, the, the, another way of dealing with this problem is, have you heard of the Trans Aqua Project? It was developed in 1980, and it takes 5% of the basin, 5% of the water of the Congo River, which is 1.9 trillion cubic meters per year. It takes 5%, joins the Obangi, goes across Central African Republic to River Chari, and refurbishes Lake Chad. This has been around for three decades. Would have transformed Central African Republic. We wouldn't have the problem we have today. Would transform the whole Central Great Lakes region. Has there is? I know Prodi is not agreeing with this. Is there? A, uh, are you familiar with the plan? And why wouldn't this have been implemented? And uh, this is a winner on all levels. And it's not going to be funded by the private sector. It has to be funded by the public sector, by governments of Africa and friendly governments such as China the New Development Bank of the BRICS. The private sector can't afford it and is uninterested in it. But this is for the security of a good portion of all of Africa would benefit from Transaqua. What's mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you very much for sharing uh, this with us, that uh, you have Lake Chad uh, close to your heart. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's why we went to Italy to do the donor conference, because Transquire is from Italy. Unfortunately for us, at the beginning, water and security were not the issue uh, in that region. And uh, we've now learned the hard way. If we had done that program, all the problems wouldn't have been here now. I, I will take the message back to our political heads that we need to get this money ourselves. And I'm sure we can get them. We have oil now in Chad. We have oil in uh, Niger. We have oil in Cameroon. Of course, Nigeria has oil for a long time. We, we can be able to fund it. Let's have the political will to do it so that we can have the support. I think I will, I will, I will pass this message. We need to do it ourselves, and we can do it. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, Swati? Thank you, too. All the panelists for uh, great presentations. I have uh, two questions. One's for Dr. Voho. Um, the first one is just a clarification. When you mentioned institutional design being exceeded, was that infrastructure or was that governance? Just a clarification on that. And then Mr. Sanusi, um, you mentioned militarization in Lake Chad, and I was just wondering if you could comment on whether the military forces were working with civilian communities, and if so, could you just describe how that partnership was taking place? Thank right. you. Should I go first? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and I should have been clearer. I think it, one follows the other. So, you know, if you're having the sudden changes in the amount of rain that's falling in a limited time period, and if that's happening repeatedly, 
then I think you will start to get challenges of how you're designing your, for example, your infrastructure. So, for example, in Johannesburg, we've been having, you know, I think we had about two weeks of solid rain that went ongoing, and the problem was that the stormwater drains are just not being cleared up. So it's kind of a knock-on, you know, if you... And, and I, that's the point I'm trying to make. If we're just doing business as usual, then um, designing the same kind of institutions over and over and over again without looking at, you know, the knock-on effects. Um, so it's not either or. I think they're both linked. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, the multinational joint test force principally are to be a deterrent. Uh, if you have a criminal going somewhere and he knows nobody's there, nobody, no, nobody to watch, uh, he has free land. But they are essentially there to be deterrents. And uh, the mode of operation, of course, is based on intelligence issues that uh, uh, the, the experts will advise. Yes, we'll have to work with the community for information gathering and uh, for their support also to see that uh, we address the issues. Terrorism is not only the problem, but it's a major problem. There are, there are other, other uh, criminal actions, uh, people um, are stealing uh, farmers' cattle, uh, trafficking, uh, drug uh, pushing, and whatever it is. So essentially, uh, we'll work with the people to ensure that there is peace and security in that area. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the force now will have to work, of course, with the community to ensure that information is gathered and we, be, we can be able to address uh, and follow uh, all the terrorists around and see what we can do uh, to address, to, to push them out or to, to catch them. And uh, as you pretty well know, uh, the U.S. government, uh, the French government, they are there with their drones and uh, they are giving us information. So we will have to work with the community, yes. Thank you. I think the issue goes beyond Lake Chad because the issue of terrorism, Boko Haram in Nigeria, which has crossed to Cameroon in Chad, is, is an issue that goes beyond the basin itself. But for now, all the African head of states in that area, they've come together to form a joint army, which is going to help in making sure that the terrorists are kept at bay and, if possible, to reduce and cancel all their activities in that area. But the negative effect of it for now is that it is very difficult, especially in the northern part of Nigeria, where the activities are going on, to see people to go there to work, not only on water resources alone, but on all other sectors, because it is a problem. So, like he said, United States of America, the French, and also, I can't remember the third one, they are already, British, British the British, America. they are there. And for instance, for more than 200 days, the Chibo girls that were abducted, they are yet to be released, and they are still kidnapping people. I think it's a serious issue that is affecting the security of the entire northern part of Nigeria, Cameroon, and also Chad. But I know that this invariably is going to affect whatever strategic plan that is going to be put in place for the development of water resources and management in that area. Not only water alone, <coughs> but in other <coughs> sectors. OK. Yes. Thank you very much for. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Scott Morgan. I want to thank you all for an excellent program. Uh, I've done some security work regarding the Central African Republic over the last year, and I was wondering what aspects will the Lake Chad Commission go in and help stabilize the CAR, because basically right now the African Union and the French have not done that good of a job so far. So. And a lot of the finding is acts over access to resources. So I was wondering, including water and oil and diamonds, so I was wondering what role could the commission play in the restoration of stability in the CAR? That's a difficult question <laughs> <laughs> to a civilian, anyway. <laughs> um, French is the colonial master in that area, as you know very well. Yes. 
So <laughs> it's very difficult to uh, to get the French to understand that uh, they need to uh, to listen to other people, not themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we we have had uh, three, four meetings of the head of states in the in the region, and uh, to our dismay, the French have not encouraged the lady to come. And it's very difficult to take a decision without head of state. Uh, we are proposing another meeting in the next uh, two or three weeks. I hope she will come. And then when she comes, she will tell her colleagues, the head of state, what her opinion is, so that we can listen to her and work with her to see how we can solve the problem. But the, the issue in, in Central Africa is poverty, and somehow somebody is polarizing into religious issue. Once you have religious problem, then it's very difficult for you to solve. But if you have uh, a take home, if you have an opportunity to improve the life of people, you can bring them together. But once there is poverty and there's religious issue, you have a, a, a great problem in your hands. I, I hope uh, in the next couple of weeks, I should be able to tell uh, Dr. Dolphin something about what you've said and see if there's some information that I can share with you how and if the president of Central Africa attend our security meeting with the other head of states so that we'll be able to know. But she has not been participating and we cannot just guess. So we need her around. I hope she listens to me and, then, and try to come. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Ilona Coyle, and I'm with the Environmental Law Institute. And I was wondering, as a regional institution and a regional NGO, respectively, how do you approach the varying levels of capacity within the member states within your region? And how do you, what approaches do you use to work with states of high capacity versus states with more problems with their capacity? Yeah, this is not all so easy. Uh, the, the commission is uh, established on the fact that, yes, some states are weak and some states are strong. Uh, let me give an example. The uh, financing formula for the function of the uh, organization is such that initially Nigeria was paying about 60 to 70 percent. But as the other countries grew, now the formula is Nigeria contributes 40 percent. Uh, Cameroon contributes uh, 20 percent, Libya 18 percent, and Central Africa that we just talked about is contributing 4 percent. It has never paid contribution in the last 20 years. So, we, 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 but that does not mean we don't do activities in the country. Of course, now uh, for the last uh, one year and a half, we are, we are not able to do anything because of security challenges. So, we, we encourage uh, yeah, member states that grow to, to speak by themselves to say we want to improve our participation either financially or technically and so far nobody has said anything. We'll continue. Thank you. Okay, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Hello, um, my name is Sophia Nuhu, uh, and I'm an intern at Brookings Institute, working on the on the project for IDPs. Um, my, I'm very curious about your five-year investment plan. I don't know when the takeoff is for the plan, and um, I'm also curious to know what, how, to what extent have you integrated technology and infrastructure building in the plan? And what measures, I mean, what proactive measures are you taking uh, to incorporate like the heightened security challenges? Because I know many people are, um, are migrating from various areas in Nigeria into the Lake Chad Basin, which is going to heighten your security issues on top of what you already have. I'm, I sh I'm sure you have many challenges, but to what extent does the plan actually address those new challenges? And how are you integrating infrastructure and technology? Yeah, it's a large question, but we can discuss more during the break. Uh, let me just briefly say that when the five-year investment plan was being developed, the security challenge was there. Unfortunately, uh, we did not have the political will to knob it at that time. 
uh, it's not uh, a secret. Nigeria and Cameroon are the bigger members in the commission, and uh, they had an unpleasant situation about Bakasi. So it was difficult for Cameroon to allow her military to come in to coexist uh, with uh, the other military, especially Nigeria, who are majority. But we have passed that stage now, and uh, we're getting more co cooperation. And unfortunately, also, uh, the, the Boko Haram have decided to, to get into Cameroon as a catalyst to getting Cameroon and court participate. So we, we are looking at that issue. Um, the entire aspect of the transboundary program and the five-year investment plan is tailored towards creating an enabling environment for peace and security, regional integration. And the national action plans, which we insist, must be part of the program as complementary, necessary complementary component, is tailored towards good governance. Uh, m most of these issues of terrorism in Africa in particular are related to bad governance. It's a fact. We all know. So if you have good governance, you are likely to have less material for, for, for the stabilization of your country. Of course, whatever you do, you'll have some bad eggs. But the majority of people are under poverty. They are not satisfied with the system. They have nothing to do. What do you expect them to do? To misbehave. So we are addressing that. And we can give you more information during the break. And uh, we can give you the, the, the document. Uh, we might have a copy of the five-year investment plan for you to see uh, and have a copy. And we can relate later on and see how we can uh, give you more information. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I know the, the, the agenda here uh, doesn't show it, but we, we do need to make a transition in the panels. So I'd like everybody to please thank, with a round of applause, our speakers. I'll catch up with them in the hall after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder why they were not asking the professors. They were asking me. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> okay, could we have the uh, next panel, um, Maris and his panel, to come up, please? <laughs> yeah, the professors are the ones who are good at it. Answer the question. No, 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 no. We leave it to the real people. <laughs> But it's an interesting issue. Huh? Yeah, I need to come yes. to South Africa and talk to you about the adoptation. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. I think I give you my time. Yes, yes, and I must give you mine. Yeah, I'm going to uh, start the session right on time, half past. So we've got ten minutes now before then, because for some people are now that's after. Kind of because that's what they're doing. Thank you. Very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah. That was a nice session. I will give you, you my time. Sure. I, I have it. I think. Well, I'll keep it. It's anyway, because I. Have